Can't believe you ate the whole thing. That'll be the hip tag. There's kind of difference, and that's a hip thing. What awful people. Sorry, it's Time Bandits. Time Bandits is a Terry Gilliam film about a kid who gets kidnapped by, slash recruited by, slash becomes the moral compass of, a uh, group of time-travelling dwarves. On the run from the supreme being, they use a map of time holes to molest and rob historical and not historical figures ultimately deciding to pursue the most fabulous object in the world, a new kitchen. The Moderna Wonder Major All-Automatic Convenient Centerette. And here they are, the winners of the most fabulous object in the world. As you might assume, it's fairly wacky and surreal. It is, however, I think, a mistake to dismiss this as a kid's film or a movie just for kids. In fact, in my opinion, it's Gilliam's masterpiece. Yes, his name most often conjures Brazil, made four years later, and Brazil certainly has a very strong and memorable setting, and really original and meaningful ideas, but I find the story a bit meandering. Here, the story is far more solid, but that's not why I give more credit to Time Bandits than Brazil. In fact, I think Time Bandits is much more subversive than Brazil. Block of ice to beef bourguignon in eight seconds. Bed. Did you know that the ancient Greek warriors had to learn 44 different ways of unarmed combat? Well, at least we've got a two-speed hedge cutter. Kevin, the abducted recruit, or recruited abductee, has very little desire to return to his own life. His parents are suburban wastrels, his kiddish curiosity having apparently emerged despite of them. But what's really subversive, for a kid's film that's at times very funny and sweet, isn't Robin Hood being a Duke of Edinburgh type phony, or God being a prickly scones and jam bureaucrat, but the glimpses of historical reality? We meet Napoleon, or a caricature of him. I think that the mayor of Castiglione and his council would like very much to surrender now, please. No, 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 no. <laughs> With this city, we have the whole area of Western Lombardy at our feet. Oh, go away! There is something humorous and bizarre, yes, but also very dark about Napoleon not being interested in accepting the surrender of Castiglione. We have, after all, just seen a firing squad. Ian Holm as Napoleon is funny, yes, but the situation is not. It's this and the second part of the film that I'm looking at here. All three are to receive summary executions today. If the Queen wishes to see me, I'll be in the courts all afternoon. Remind the Queen that I still rule this city. It's as if for 20 seconds we're watching a political drama set in Greece two and a half thousand years ago. It's not funny. The only slightly funny bit is Kevin playing and not paying any attention. But because it's only there for 15 seconds, because we never get to know any more of the intrigue here or what the Queen might be up to, it's easy to overlook. But still, Gilliam put these here. These tiny pinpricks of coldness are here for a reason. There's something to be said about the whole thing being a dream, or partly a dream, or the fantasy of a young boy. But for me, these two tiny moments of Napoleon's generals pleading with him to accept a city surrender, and King Agamemnon signing death warrants as if it's part of his daily routine, ground the film. It's a silly, fun fantasy with some fantastical ideas and a lot of fleshed out character and humour, but I think it's got a lot to say about reality, about the mundanity of it and the nastiness of it, and I think these two little moments show how subversive it is, because unlike Brazil, that isn't immediately obvious. It's treated as matter of fact, and because of that I think Time Bandits' tiny edge is especially sharp. and the kid who played Kevin grew up to be Matt Damon. Tomorrow, it's terror at the South Pole.